Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure and privilege to announce the regents, senior officials, the faculty, staff, and retirees representing Memorial University. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, the region's senior officials, faculty, staff, and retirees representing Memorial University of Newfoundland and Labrador. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure and privilege by the Chief Justice of Newfoundland and Labrador, Deborah Fry, the Justices of the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court, Justice Henri Brown of the Federal Court of Canada, Chief Justice Pamela Golding and the Judges of the Provincial Court of Newfoundland and Labrador.
and gentlemen, please be seated to await the arrival of Her Honour, the Lieutenant Governor. Ladies and gentlemen, Ladies and gentlemen, as you are able, please rise for the arrival of Her Honour Judy M. Foote, Lieutenant Governor of Newfoundland and Labrador, and please remain standing for the Royal Salute. Gentlemen, please be seated.
Martin Stringer again, and as we await the beginning of these official ceremonies and this funeral for John Crosby, you can see the, uh, the uh, dignitaries who are there, obviously the Prime Minister, Judy Foote, who is now the Lieutenant Governor of Newfoundland. You can also see, we also saw images of the Premier of Newfoundland, uh, Dwight Ball, uh, also uh, some of Mr. Crosby's former Cabinet colleagues, and you'll see the face of uh, Peter McKay, as well as Jean Charest, who went on to become uh, Premier of Quebec. Uh, interestingly, uh, many of the faces in that crowd, several of them are uh, possible contenders for the leadership of the Conservative Party of Canada. They have yet to decide, but uh, obviously Peter McKay has already thrown his hat in the ring. You'll also uh, hear from Ches Crosby, who's Mr. Crosby's son, but he's also the uh, leader of the uh, Newfoundland and Labrador Conservative uh, Conservative Party, and he will be giving an address. How things will proceed is that they will start with opening sentences, and then there will be tributes from son, Ches Crosby, and also from Brian Mulroney, who will give the main eulogy. And of course, Brian Mulroney, uh, John Crosby, served as minister for Mr. Mulroney, as a transport minister, trade minister, fisheries minister, and uh, you can there you can see Fabian Manning, who's a senator, but also a good friend of Mr. Crosby's family. Uh, so we are just awaiting the official beginning of the ceremonies, the funeral ceremonies for John Crosby, who passed away last Friday at the age of 88. Uh, his wife is in attendance, Jane Crosby, and uh, literally the who's who of Newfoundland, as people remember, one of Canada's most respected and best known politicians. So we're going to just let you go back to those ceremonies and watch as they get underway.
not believe in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. We brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. Whether we live, we live unto the Lord, or whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his abundant mercy, hath begotten us again unto a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Good afternoon. Please be seated. A warm welcome to you all today as we gather with the Crosby family to celebrate and to give thanks for the life of John Carnell Crosby. On behalf of our cathedral family, I extend our deepest condolences to Jane, Chess, Beth, Michael, and all your family, and assure you of our continued prayers and support. It must be very comforting to you to have a few hundred of your closest friends drop by this afternoon to help celebrate and to remember John. Thank you all for joining us. At this time, I invite Mr. Chess Crosby to come forward and offer a tribute on behalf of the family. My father was a great reader. And for those of you who knew him well, he was always prepared and left little to chance. In his later years, when asked what he was reading, with a glint in his eye, he'd reply, the Bible. I want to be ready for my final exam. <laughs> he might have come across St. Paul, who wrote, God will render to every man according to his works, to those who by patience in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality. He will give eternal life. My father accepted the principle that political autobiography is the best way to tell the truth about others. <laughs> His memoir, No Holds Barred, 
my life in politics, relates many truths about himself as well as others. A Globe and Mail review stated that Crosby's book reminds us of a more classical conception of politics, where men and women struggle against the implacable forces of interest, time, and contingency, as well as against their own defects to leave their mark on human events and earn honor and respect from their fellow citizens. For our father, politics was a calling to service. He did it oh so well. Among the good works that leave their mark on human events in his beloved province and country are free trade, Hibernia, the jewel in our offshore crown, and the Atlantic Accord. On these still rest the cornerstone of our economic prospects, and the honor and respect earned by my father and his willing colleagues. In No Holds Barred, he writes of the Crosby qualities of honesty and abiding love of Newfoundland and Labrador and an empathy for her people. While his honesty was legendary, it often got my father into hot water. The CBC once wrote that he carries around in that great head a little voice which murmurs from time to time, go ahead, Johnny, say it. <laughs> what the hell? That little voice led him to tell the press that he had not read the entire text of the Free Trade Agreement and that no one else in the government had either. <laughs> he was the only one truthful enough to say so. As he later explained, I decided never to let myself be imprisoned by the wardens of the penitentiary of political correctness. Dad loved pithy quotes. One of his favorites was by Bernard Baruch. Many a man waits for his ship to come in, even though he never sent one out. <laughs> and Dad loved to laugh, especially at his own jokes. He relished having one of his own quips recounted. His comeback to Joe Who was Pierre Y. Dad was loyal to the core, and he never wavered in helping a friend or political foe. In recalling a warm friendship, former Prime Minister Jean Chrétien said that they happily appeared for and with each other on many occasions. Dad became a recording artist. His reading of Twas the Night Before Christmas in Newfoundland in support of charity was a sellout favorite. And Dad loved tennis. On the court, he was fiercely competitive, but he ran little. He left that to his doubles partner. <laughs> Dad was a loving husband. Among the many tributes that we have gratefully received this past week, Rex Murphy wrote that Jane and John were all things to each other in a career so thick with tumult and triumph Jane was the bulwark and mainstay. She counseled and cautioned him, was haven during the storms, and a pilot for his many triumphs. Our father knew this. All our family and friends knew this. And our mother certainly knew this. Speaking at a celebration for his 25th anniversary in politics, she said, John has worked with two Joes, one Frank, two Bryans, but only one Jane. <laughs> she notes that he would often say that he was just a foot soldier. To that she would add, of course, sometimes he found himself marching to the beat of a different drummer. Mom, for being dad's love, his anchor, and the very core of his being, we, your generations, pay tribute to you and thank you. 
In this world, there could be no more powerful example of the strength and beauty of joining two people than your strong union over the past 68 years. Dad reveled in his role as a parent. Michael, Beth, and I always knew we were cherished. As grandchildren and great-grandchildren came along, his heart grew a size larger with each child. While many knew him as a giant in the world of politics, for us, John Crosby was a gentle giant in the life of our family. My father well wears the words of Shakespeare from Hamlet, which he delivered at the eulogy of his brother, Andrew. His life was gentle, and the elements so mixed in him that nature might stand up and say to all the world, this was a man. We thank those here today and all Newfoundlanders and Labradorians and Canadians across our nation in helping us to say a final goodbye to our father, grandfather, and great-grandfather. His was a legacy to celebrate and a life to emulate. If, as St. Paul said, good works earn eternal life, John Crosby passed his final exam with distinction. Ladies and gentlemen, the Right Honorable Brian Mulroney. If a Prime Minister of Canada is lucky, and I mean really lucky. He gets to have a John Crosby in his cabinet. One, not two. <laughs> As I sat across the cabinet table from John for nine years and watched him in action, I knew that as Prime Minister, I had just been handed a major gift. A man of high principle and unassailable integrity, John was direct and thoughtful in his approach, brilliant, humorous, fully prepared, as Jess has just said, in advancing major questions of public policy, and loyal and supportive of me and my cabinet and caucus colleagues in the House of Commons. Years ago, Prime Minister Pearson, in describing the challenges and the cut and thrust of politics at the highest level in Canada, wrote, don't be downhearted in the thick of battles. It's where all good men would wish to be. John Crosby's close friendship, valued counsel, and unswerving support made that come true for me. The Canada-US Free Trade Agreement NAFTA, a wave of privatizations, deregulation, reduction in the federal deficit, the introduction of inflation reduction targets and price stability, historic tax reform that included the GST. That was John's idea, not mine. <laughs> the creation of the Atlantic Canada Opportunities Agency, the Atlantic Accord with Brian Peckford's government, Hibernia. And why do I mention these initiatives today? Well, for a very good reason. Because each one was part of the foundation 
of a completely modernized Canadian economy. And John was present at the conception and implementation of them all. Together, these policies, which were initially strongly resisted in Parliament and across the country, thank you, Brian Tobin, have over time quite simply transformed Canada. When I think of these achievements and the unremitting hard work behind them by leaders like John, a line from Longfellow comes to mind. The heights by great men reached and kept were not attained by sudden flight, but they, while their companions slept, were working upward in the night. There are very few Canadians whose leadership contributions to our country and to Newfoundland and Labrador will resonate as powerfully and as durably in history as the body of work left to us by John Crosby. John Crosby était également un visionnaire qui connaissait très bien l'histoire de notre pays et qui comprenait parfaitement le rôle vital joué par les francophones dans notre révolution et dans l'épanouissement du français en terre d'Amérique. John n'a donc pas hésité un instant avant d'appuyer la création du sommet de la francophonie et la négociation des accords du lac Meach et de Charlottetown. Il a fait honneur à son pays. It was another somber day in Ottawa in the summer of 1990. We were in the middle of a worldwide recession. Meech had been defeated in the Quebec caucus, 63 members strong at the previous election, were devastated and angry. Free trade was off to a slow start, and Canadians were sharpening their knives for me in anticipation of the GST. John Crosby sat in my center block office towards the end of the afternoon, just the two of us. Hibernia was on the agenda, and the companies were asking for a $2.7 billion guarantee in order to bring the oil on stream, and without which the project would surely atrophy and die. This idea was widely opposed by many business and interest groups, and even the influential Toronto Globe and Mail had weighed in with a powerful editorial against Hibernia. The Finance Department of the Government of Canada was very skeptical because of our burgeoning deficit brought on by the recession. John said quietly, Prime Minister, I know that the Quebec caucus and many others oppose this. But you have often said that what you wanted was to give Newfoundland a hand up, not a handout. Well, he continued, this, this Prime Minister is the hand up we need. And I think it will deeply transform the economy of Newfoundland and Labrador and give all Newfoundlanders, finally, the hope for a better day. He concluded, and I quote him, I hate to ask you to speak to the Quebec caucus again after what they have just suffered through with the rejection of Meech. But in my view, it's the only way we can get it done. I leave it entirely in your hands, unquote. John's loyalty and strength and enormous contribution to Canada had brought him to this moment. And as I looked at him that day in the fading sunlight of a lovely Ottawa summer afternoon, I just knew he was right. And I knew as well that I had to do it. And so I met with Michael Wilson, Minister of Finance, and Don Mazankowski my Deputy Prime Minister, I met again with the entire Quebec caucus, and then I called a special meeting of the full cabinet. I told them then that I was fully aware of their strong opposition 
hesitations and concerns. But that I had decided such action, and Joe was with me that day, namely and approving. Joe was approving of this as well. Namely, approving a $2.7 billion financial guarantee for Hibernia that included an important equity purchase. I thought it was, and I said, this is in the Canadian national interest, and my government is going to proceed with this to enable Newfoundland and Labrador to have a chance at prosperity. As I concluded, I could see, sense that John, who this day was seated on my left, was overcome with emotion, only to recover and whisper, thank you, Prime Minister, and then looking at his colleagues, thank you all. But as I wrote in my memoirs, the truth is that while I took the decision as Prime Minister, someone's got to decide, as I took the decision and battled it through the system, and I said in my memoirs, Newfoundland owed an enormous amount to John Crosby, as did Canada. So it really was done as a tribute to John Crosby's leadership and his vision for a better day for his beloved province. The final word years later went to Jeffrey Simpson, the Globe and Mail senior columnist, and I quote, no one now thinks as many in his cabinet and editorial writers at this newspaper did at the time. No one now thinks that Prime Minister Mulroney acted rashly in supporting the development of Hibernia offshore oil fields that have done so much for Newfoundland, unquote. In fact, that decision was the seminal moment in my many, many years of valued friendship and active cooperation with John Crosby. The truth is, Hibernia was his moment, and Hibernia was his dream. Now, Commentators have discussed the Crosby sense of humor. <laughs> Funny, I never saw any of it. <laughs> so here we are at another cabinet meeting a little while later, and the Minister of Communications came in with a project, un projet de loi, uh, to um, create a new instrument called Newsworld and to fund it with a further grant to the CBC. So the debate went around the, the cabinet table and finally John put up his hand. Now, I can't imitate him, but I'm going to try, what the hell. He put up his hand and you know, Many of you know that when he was trying to make an important point, he closed his eyes. <laughs> so I knew it was going to be important because both of them were bat shut. <laughs> so he puts up his hand and he said, Prime Minister, may I say something? I said, sure, John, what is it? He said, as I understand it, we are presently giving the CBC, a billion dollars a year so they can savage us 18 hours a day. Said, Is that right, Prime Minister? I said, well, well, John, it's just about right. And he said, as I understand this one today, we are going to create an instrument called Newsworld, and we are going to give the CBC another $200 million so they can savage us 24 hours a day. <laughs> Is that right, Prime Minister? I said, well, I think so, John. <laughs> he said, well, Prime Minister, I'm going to need your help. You're a very smart man, and you're a great speaker, Prime Minister. You're very eloquent. I'm going to ask you to come with me to Newfoundland and speak to the good people of Newfoundland to convince them a little bit, because they have never heard of anything so stupid in their entire <laughs> lives. Uh, 
So I said, John, if it's okay, I'll pass on that trip. <laughs> well, James Joyce once wrote that the past is consumed in the present, and the present is alive only because it gives birth to the future. Well, John Crosby made certain with his exemplary life and sterling contribution that the future of his Canada and that of Newfoundland and Labrador that he had served so honorably and well for so long will bring opportunity and hope and happiness to all who hold our coveted citizenship as the decades unfold and Canada continues on its ongoing path to higher achievement, greatness, and success. And 50 or 100 years from now, if Canadians stop for just a moment to reflect on the leaders and builders who brought our country to such a commanding place in the community of nations, I believe that many will whisper a special word of gratitude to John Crosby, whose nation-building contributions will then be even more evident than they are today. And they will know then, as we do today, what an exceptional man he was and how splendidly he served Canada and all of her people. You know, at a certain age, many people, and not just former prime ministers, wonder from time to time how they will be remembered in the unfolding decades. One of Canada's fathers of confederation, Thomas Darcy McGee, an immigrant from Ireland, reflected this sentiment in one of his poems. Am I remembered in Aaron? I charge you, speak me true. Has my name a sound, a meaning, in the scenes my boyhood knew? Well, so long as the bitter February winds sweep across Labrador on their way to the Avalon Peninsula, and the warm summer rains caress the fertile lands and gardens of his beloved Hogan's Pond, the achievements of John Crosby will be remembered and revered by his friends and their children and their children as a model for them to replicate and respect. When McGee died in Ottawa in 1868, Sir John A. Macdonald paid tribute to him in these words. His hand was open to everyone. His heart was made for friendship. These words of Canada's first Prime Minister elegantly describe as well some of the qualities of the Honourable John Crosby. He was a friend for all seasons. Loyalty was an integral part of his character. He stood with his friends when times were good, and he was steadfast and true when times were not. In Macdonald's words, his heart is made for friendship. And I can tell you all that my family and I knew this well. And so we say goodbye today. Au revoir to the Honorable John Crosby, patriot, senior cabinet minister, devoted partner to his beloved Jane, loving father, grandfather, and great-grandfather to all of his children and their children, indomitable defender of the people of Newfoundland and Labrador, and a proud Canadian who served our country with high distinction, unblemished integrity, and unprecedented achievement. No one, no one could ask for more.
while you're standing, we're going to sing. <laughs> Please join us as we sing together all things bright and beautiful. As you remain standing, let us pray. O Lord, the maker and redeemer of all believers, grant to the faithful departed all the unsearchable benefits of thy son's passion, that in the day of his appearing they may be manifested as thy true children. Through the same thy son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. We welcome Mr. David Pomeroy and Mr. Brian Way as they perform the Lord's Prayer by Malat. Tina. 
Invite Ms. Beth Crosby to do our first reading. A reading from the book of Ecclesiastes. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to throw away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. The word of the Lord. A reading from the Gospel of John. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The word of the Lord. <laughs> Please join us as we sing together, Eternal Father, strong to save.
confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. I speak to you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Please be seated. It dawned on me while I was uh, listening to Mr. Mulroney speaking that the church is an interesting place to go to, isn't it? There's not many places where you go where you put your keynote speakers right at the beginning. <laughs> One of the many phrases I've heard used to describe John Crosby in these past few days is larger than life. His many titles, his accomplishments, his long and significant influence on the life of our province and our nation, not to mention his large personality all lead one to an image which transcends the average person. It is indeed a picture which is larger than most lives. And I am thankful that it's not my role to talk about the larger-than-life nature of John Crosby's life. That role has already been fulfilled, and my thanks to you both. That being said, I do tend to talk about things that are larger than life on a regular basis, <laughs> especially on occasions such as this. While at Memorial University, where John Crosby served as chancellor, I recall studying the eminent German philosopher and theologian Rudolf Otto, who explored humanity's search for and, and dependence on the, the other that which is more than what we see, that which is, if you will, larger than life. In his famous book, The Idea of the Holy, he referred to this, this other as the numinous. Now, don't worry. That's as far as I will delve into German philosophy today. Suffice it to say that this numinous entity which Otto described is what we, in our faith community as Christians, refer to as God. Our relationship with God, with Jesus Christ, provides each and every one of us with a larger-than-life experience. This is an experience and relationship which stretches beyond what we can live and beyond what we can even imagine in this life. That relationship comes with many promises from God to us. First and foremost is the promise of love. From the very moment of our birth as children of God, we are loved by God. We are beloved of God. That love follows us through all our days, whether we recognize it or choose to accept it. And then that love follows us through the death of the body and into eternal life. As our gospel reading from John this afternoon reminded us, Jesus has gone before us to prepare a place for us. 
this relationship with our God is truly larger than life, as it follows us beyond this life into eternity with the one who loves us more than we can ask or imagine. While we might sit here wondering what that love is like, wondering what lies beyond the grave, John Colonel Crosby is abiding even now in the presence of that eternal love, which is our God. Rest eternal grant unto him, O Lord, and let light perpetual shine upon him. Amen.
may remain seated for the prayers and follow in our order of service. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Savior of the world, who by thy cross and precious blood hast redeemed us, Save us and help us. Graciously look upon our afflictions, O Lord. Make thy servants to be numbered with thy saints. Almighty God, with whom do live the spirits of them that depart hence in the Lord, and with whom the souls of the faithful are in joy and felicity, we praise and magnify thy holy name for all thy servants who have finished their course and kept the faith. And committing our brother John to thy gracious keeping, we pray that we with him and with all those that are departed in the true faith of thy holy name may have our perfect consummation and bliss, both in body and soul, in thy eternal and everlasting glory, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O God, whose days are without end and whose mercies cannot be numbered, make us, we beseech thee, deeply sensible of the shortness and uncertainty of human life. And let thy Holy Spirit lead us in holiness and righteousness all our days that when we shall have served thee in our generation, we may be gathered unto our fathers, having the testimony of a good conscience in the communion of the Catholic Church, in the confidence of a certain faith, in the comfort of a reasonable religious and holy hope, in favor with thee, our God, and in perfect charity with all people. Grant this, we beseech thee, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, Father of all mercies and giver of all comfort, 
deal graciously, we pray thee, with those who mourn, that casting every care on thee, they may know the consolation of thy love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Give rest, O Christ, to thy servant with thy saints, where sorrow and pain are no more, neither sighing, but life everlasting. Where thou, O Christ, with the Holy Ghost, art most high in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Rest eternal grant unto him, O Lord, and let light perpetual shine upon him. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you all this day and forevermore. Amen. Please join us once again as we sing together, Onward Christian Soldiers, and we will follow that with the Ode to Newfoundland and O Canada.
Hello again, I'm Martin Stringer, and you have been watching the funeral ceremonies for John Crosby at the St. John the Baptist Anglican Cathedral in St. John's. You can see now as the celebrants leave the cathedral, that's in St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador. John Crosby, as you heard, one of Canada's most accomplished and certainly widely respected politicians. He was a member of Brian Mulroney's cabinet. He held several portfolios, and he also served as Newfoundland's and Labrador's Lieutenant Governor. He died last Friday at the age of 88, and as you heard, some really fond and some amusing memories from both his son, Ches Crosby, and from Brian Mulroney, former Prime Minister, who gave eulogies. Well, that's it for our special coverage. If you missed any of the ceremony, if you'd like to see it again or you watch it online, you can go to uh, cpac.ca. And again tonight, we'll, present, uh, we'll have for you the ceremony at 5 p.m. Eastern on Primetime Politics here on CPAC. And now we will refer return you to our regularly scheduled programming. Mon invité, Caroline Poddy, nous parle de son combat pour la parité.